Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in. And uh, we thank the listeners for taking the time out of their busy schedules and uh, tuning in. Today, this morning on the program, my guest is returning guest uh, uh, John Daniel, author of the book The Grand Design Exposed. Brother John Daniel, good brother in the Lord, a friend of mine, he also recommended this book that we've been studying on uh, Inquisition Update entitled The Ark and the Dove by J. Moss Ives. And as you'll recall, we've been talking about this commission that was comprised of Benjamin Franklin, Samuel Chase, Charles Carroll II, Charles Carroll of Carrollton, Jesuit trained, uh, an influential first citizen of Maryland and a relative, a Jesuit priest, a, an actual Jesuit priest by the name of Charles Carroll, were selected by the, the uh, Continental Congress to make a pilgrimage to Canada to secure Canada's support for the Revolutionary War upcoming. And the Jesuit priest John Carroll, in the book, as recorded in the Ark and the Dove, said that he w- uh, would go, but the best that they could uh, expect for an outcome was to secure neutrality from Canada, French Catholic Canada, and that Canada would not side with the British in the Revolutionary War. And I've said to my listeners, there's much, much more here than meets the eye, much, much more that uh, to be known about this commission and what actually took place than this author, J. Moss Ives, in this book is letting us know. And and uh, I've invited uh, John Daniel to come and help fill in some of the gaps to help this help make more sense out of what happened during this period of time. My guest this morning. John Daniel. Good morning, John. Good morning, uh, good morning, Tom. And uh, again, as always, I thank you so very much for uh, allowing me on your show. And uh, it's always a privilege and an honor to share these thoughts uh, of what really took place uh, in the founding of our United States of American government. And uh, this uh, this history has been buried has been covered over, and um, and so um, when we try to uh, revive it, to dig it up, and to, uh, to share with folks, uh, they absolutely don't even know what we're talking about, and um, but that was the purpose to read this history from a Roman Catholic standpoint so that um, you're you're getting this information from the horse's mouth, so to speak, and I don't care if you're reading um, different authors of this same particular history, you will get the same uh, history. Uh, it might take a little variety as far as how it's being uh, presented, but I'll assure you, it is telling you the exact same story that the Roman Catholic Church, the Jesuits, uh, were fully involved in um, orchestrating the events that were taking place during that time in order to separate the colonies, the Protestant colonies, from this mother country that was such an incredible tyrant, according to uh, the official history, uh, that they had to separate and uh, declare a new nation. And uh, what, what you were taught from a baby up, and what I, <clears throat> what I was taught from a baby up, is quite contrary to what the historical facts actually tell you and when you read it from the Roman Catholic standpoint then you are absolutely getting the truth of what really took place and at the time when all of this was going on 
it was one of the most incredible tight secrets of all ages so that nobody really knew what was going on except the very ones that were at the top that were involved in it. And uh, this is what makes this history so mysterious, I guess. Uh, and some of the things that we read, unless you have the full background of what really, what their ultimate goal was, uh, it's, it gets a person to start scratching their head. What is really going on here? And uh, that's, uh, well, I have many books, as I have stated before, in my library when I was putting my own book together, Tom, and I used to live in secondhand bookstores, and sometimes I didn't even know really before I got the full picture. I didn't even know what I was looking for. Uh, then I was just was looking for the truth to find out exactly uh, what was going on during those years. And so this is, the Ark and the Dove is just one of these sources that uh, that are out there. And the Jesuits themselves wrote their history, and that's something that the Jesuit has always done. They have, no matter where they go in this world on their mission, they always report to their superiors. The superiors uh, uh, report to their superiors, and in the end, it all goes to the superior general uh, of the Jesuits, and it's all compiled. And that's how he that's how he controls and plans his next strategy to fulfill their ultimate goal. And uh, their ultimate goal is only one purpose, and that is to rule the whole world. And we have seen this literally taking shape ready before our eyes today. And, and given, the way given that when this thing is, when this bombshell explodes upon us, the whole world is going to just, well... They're going to be overwhelmed. That's the best way I can put it. They're going to be overwhelmed because nobody, nobody seems to understand what really is going on today. And just because they are not persecuting people today doesn't mean that that's not what Rome is is going to uh, not be doing in the in the near future. And so uh, you might be under the name of the New World Order or however you want to term it, but uh, these are all fronts. That the, that the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church works behind so that they're not in the limelight until they are prepared to be in the limelight. And one of these days they will be in the limelight. And this is what is known in Roman Catholic literature itself. One day the Virgin Mary will triumph. Make no bones about it. That's what they teach. And Doubt it not, it will take place. And so this is what we're trying to unravel here in this uh, uh, the commission that was uh, sent up to Canada uh, as they be were in the process of starting the Revolutionary War to separate the colonies from the mother country, England, which was and had declared itself to be a Protestant nation. And the whole struggle was, was to get England back into the fold of Rome. And that's the picture, the struggle, the incredible struggle, that has been totally buried and covered up today. But Rome knows that once she conquers the English-speaking people as a Protestant people, then Protestantism completely is dead. And they know that. And that's their ultimate goal. So, anyhow, this was the first stages of it uh, in this so-called great work. And to represent that great work, is what you see 
on the back of your one dollar bill. And we've we've talked about this before, Tom. You know, uh, but this is the American Great Seal that you see there on the back of the one dollar bill. It was put there, not on the dollar bill, but it became what you see there on the dollar bill. It was the American Great Seal, and what it see what you see there is actually what it was as stamped on official documents that goes out of Washington, D.C., from the very day that this nation became a nation, because every nation must have a seal to do business with other nations of the world. And so this great seal is a little bit different from any other seal in the world, because what you see there is that it's telling you that there is a great work, and it's not completed, and that's what the pyramid represents, this great work. Great work of who? Well, we're learning that it's the great work of the Jesuits. Manny P. Hall says that the American Great Seal is the signature of the Jesuits. Comprehend that a little bit. And so we know what the Jesuits have in mind, and we know what the Roman Catholic Church has always had in mind, because they teach to the whole world that they are the only true church whereby which mankind must be saved. And so they want to convert the whole world to that truth that they maintain is the truth. And I won't get into what that truth is and what they really represent this morning, but uh, that's their whole goal, that their ultimate goal is to rule and control every human being on this planet and they have set up the machinery they have set the stage and their curtain is about to rise for the last uh, show here on planet earth let's put it that way <laughs> so that's the story that we're looking straight in the face of and of course um, what we're talking about here as far as this commission that went to, to Canada um, was a commission that was to go up there and uh, sue the uh, French uh, Roman Catholic Canadians that now was uh, no longer French, but it had been captured by... Uh, England, and so um, the American colonists want to go up and try to uh, convince these French uh, Roman Catholics to take sides and fight alongside of them, and so that's why the commission was sent up there uh, to accomplish that, and um, because because. The Canadians, they were French, Roman Catholics. Uh, that's why it was chosen, or at least it may was made to appear to choose, uh, well, men who were Roman Catholic. And that's why Charles Carroll was elected to go, and his uh, uh, cousin, uh, John Carroll, who was actually a Jesuit. Of course, as you know, in 1773, the Jesuits were officially dissolved as an order of priests. And all of this was done. Whether anybody wants to accept this historical fact or not, but all of this was done, was to make it to appear that the Jesuits had nothing to do with what was going on because they were no longer uh, an order of priests anymore. They were dissolved. They were dissolved by the Pope himself. And so this is the history that surrounds this whole mysterious uh, time period that we're looking into. 
again, that has been buried and has been covered up. So when they got to Canada, there was some, what the Roman Catholic uh, author here is saying, there were some very major blunders that had taken place by the Continental Congress. Um, there were some very strong Protestants here still in the colonies. But these Protestants didn't really know exactly what was going on. Only those at the top, the Jesuits and those high-ranking Freemasons, really understood what was going on. And so the Protestants were basically in the dark, and they were convinced they, you know, we got to separate we got to separate the colonies from England because of hey this incredible taxation that uh, that England is doing to us. But what they couldn't figure out was that Parliament was being um, orchestrated also over there in England, and so England passes a law that the French Canadians. Will will not be molested. They will be allowed to have their civil and religious liberties to, to continue on just as they were when they were under French rule. And some of these uh, fellows here in the colonies in the Continental Congress that were Protestant, uh, they 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 wrote to England, and they were quite in a rage about it. Uh, they could not understand how Parliament could pass such a law. And I'm going to read again from the Ark and the Dove um, what, what, what was brought to the Parliament's attention. And it says, nor can we suppress, and I'm quoting here now from the book Ark of the Dove, nor can we suppress our astonishment that a British Parliament should ever consent to establish in that country a religion that has deluged your island with blood and dispersed impiety, bigotry, persecution, murder, rebellion, to every part of the world. So there were those who fully understood uh, that there was something going on here that they couldn't quite understand. And so they, they raised their voice about it. And those who knew what was going on they had they had to change this whole thing around, and they knew when they went up to Canada that they had a job on their hands because all they were hearing from the colonists was anti-Roman Catholicism, and now they're sending the Continental Congress is now sending their group up to soothe their fears as far as anti-Catholicism is concerned, and they are telling the French Canadians that, uh, hey, we want to offer freedom of religion and civil liberties to everyone. And they, the French Canadians, uh, <laughs> well, they became very suspicious. They were very cautious. They didn't, uh, they didn't believe what they were hearing. And, uh, uh, and that's why they elected Charles Carroll to go, because he's Roman Catholic. He studied under the Jesuit. That's why they elected John Carroll to go, because he was a Jesuit. And when they got to Canada, you realize in the book, The Ark of the Dove, that 
the Jesuit that was in Canada received John Carroll very warmly because he knew what was going on. The Canadian bishop, even though he was Roman Catholic, he didn't trust the commissioners that were sent up by the Continental Congress. And he would have nothing to do with them. But the whole thing basically, even though they never won the French Canadians to their side, to join them against what they call the common enemy of England, at least they gained what was called a neutrality where they would not participate. And so they figured, hey, that was good enough. That was good enough. And so uh, that's the way that they came away from that uh, situation. And one of the things that's most interesting is that the army that was up there, um, the American army that was up there in, in, in French uh, of Canada, England sent a ship with a thousand troops on it, and the American army that was so straggly and had no, hardly had food or uh, decent conditions even to live up there, they, they became, they went into a panic, and they went into a rout. And uh, uh, it's, what I'm trying to stress here is to show just how feeble the American Continental Army really was, no matter where. And yet they won this battle of the revolution uh, against England when just a few years before that, England won the battle of the French and Indian warrior war and took all of Canada away from France. And uh, this is the irony of this whole thing. And you, you begin to become very suspicious of what was really going on there because it's like two boxers in a ring. And his uh, manager tells him, hey, you got to throw this fight here tonight because I got a large bet on the side that you are going to, uh, that you're going to lose. In other words, the bet was on the other side. Uh, and so this is exactly what went on during the American Revolutionary War when you fully understand it. They threw the war. In other words, they made it to appear that the colonists were superior and to feel then the incredible uh, military of the nation of England. And so, anyhow, um, they came away uh, with a neutrality, and uh, Benjamin Franklin was in very poor health. He hardly made it back to the to the colonies, but uh, uh, John Carroll accompanied him, and uh, Sort of looked over him and uh, took care of him, and he, uh, they were all they were all very good friends. They were all very good friends. And, uh, okay, John, we're going into a break. We'll continue with our guest John Daniel in our discussion when we return from the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. We'll be right back. program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. 
So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a re-established Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions, and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using Scripture to interpret Scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border. Dot org, C-R-O-S-S, crossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. Okay, welcome back to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Now... Back to our guest, John Daniel. I'm, I'm, I can't help but tell you that I'm a bit confused. If the Jesuits wanted to foment a revolution of the colonies from Protestant Great Britain so that Catholicism could practice in the colonies without the restrictions placed upon it in Protestant Great Britain for all the the attempts that the papacy made to overthrow the crown and control Congre- uh, of the parliament and to return the papacy to, to ultimate supremacy in Britain and bring Protestant Great Britain back into the fold of Rome and to destroy Protestantism in Great Britain and thereby destroy Protestantism all over the globe. I mean, that was their intent. If they could destroy Protestantism in England then Protestantism would would have been defeated. That was the attitude of Rome. That's why they worked so so diligently to to take back over uh, England. That's why they launched the the Spanish Inquisition. That's why they sent the Jesuits on a mission to England. Uh, that's why they conducted the the gunpowder plot and assassination attempts against the kings and queens of England. A constant battle to regain control of Britain. Uh, if, if they could separate the colonies from Great Britain, then 
Catholicism could could practice without the anti-Catholic laws that were so common in Britain of necessity. And it seems to me, it just seems to me that if nat- uh, common sense would tell me that if the Jesuits were were holding to that mission, that the best thing would for them to do would be to allow this commission to recruit the assistance of French Catholic Canada to join on the side of the patriots in, in, in the colonies to to rout the British Navy and to engage in a full-blown war against Protestant Great Britain, not only to damage Protestant Great Britain, but to solidify the Catholic uh, population uh, of the of the colonies. But instead, this commission failed and merely managed to secure from French Catholic Canada neutrality in the upcoming uh, revolution. But you're you're telling me that 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 England literally threw the war. They they just laid they laid down. They didn't fight with full vigor. That it was that the that the British part of the Revolutionary War was just a pretense for appearances for outward appearances, and that there was a power controlling Britain at the time that wanted to ensure that the colonies were independent. Is that what you're saying? That's exactly what I'm saying. And when I say England through the war, it was through their generals that they that the war was was thrown because they were high ranking Freemasons and they were commissioned by those of Freemasonry through the Jesuits, which controlled Freemasonry, to throw the war, to throw these battles when you fully understand it. And I could never talk on this show long enough to convince a person who is an American patriot that has been taught from a baby up to believe Otherwise than what they have been taught from a baby up. That the great American Revolution, the heroes of George Washington and the founding fathers were so incredibly awesome to stand against this incredible military might of England and win this war. But, you see, they also had some help. <laughs> yeah. And that was from the French. The colonists now, who were originally British-trained military soldiers, now, that just a few years before, had fought the French to win French Canadians over to be under the rule of England, now these same colonists are fighting England and its military and have appealed to France to help them to fight England in their noble cause against this incredible tyrant. And you know, when you read the Ark and the Dove, it makes very plain that there was only one man that was responsible, or basically two, but one man in particular that was responsible for bringing France into the war of the American Revolution. And that was Charles Curl. 
they wanted to nominate him. The Continental Congress wanted to nominate him and send him over to France. And he says, no, no, no. I am the one person that must never be in the forefront. He worked behind the scenes. He didn't want to be publicly known what was going on. Well, he was a pretty public person. I mean, he was first citizen of Baltimore. He was commissioned by the, the Continental Congress to head up this commission to go to, to France. I mean, he's, off, he's, a, he's a very public figure in the colonies, not just in Maryland, but all over the place. That's what I confusing. have to agree with that. That's I have confusing. to agree with that. He was. But how much of this is known? How much of this is known is taught to anyone? The Carroll family is a completely unknown figure of the American Revolution. Yeah, there's nothing ever taught uh, in the school. There's there. nothing, nothing historically ever taught about him. Only in Roman Catholic literature itself do you realize that this man and his cousin, John Curl, Charles Curl was the wealthiest person in the colonies. He had that wealth. He had his incredible plantations and manor. He had his over 300 slaves. And so he had the power. He had the wealth. He had the influence. And while he was, he spent 17 years Charles Carroll spent 17 years being educated by the Jesuits in France, also in England. And he had many, many connections. And so he sent his emissaries over to France to do the work that they wanted to elect to send him to do. And who were these emissaries? Benjamin Franklin. A Freemason. Thomas Jefferson. And they worked hand in glove with the Jesuits and the Pope. And these are our heroes of the Founding Fathers. They knew what they were doing. They knew exactly what they were doing. And when you read it from a Catholic standpoint... You know they knew what they were doing. But nobody wants to admit that today because these heroes have been indelibly etched into our minds that they were the greatest of the great of the American system. It's the most beautiful picture that you ever wanted to see, but it's also the greatest and most beautiful deception that you'll ever want to see, too, when you understand it fully. And that's why nobody wants to accept this, and that's why we're talking about it right now, because nobody wants to accept it any more than anybody wants to accept right now. You tell me anybody out there on the street or anybody that's listening to right now will believe that the Roman Catholic Church and the Jesuits are fully behind what they call the New World Order. Yeah, it's a tough sell. Well, barely anybody in this country other than Roman Catholics know anything about the Jesuit order. And they certainly know nothing about the Jesuits' role in fomenting the revolution against Britain and what role Catholicism has played in the American government since our very founding. I mean, this book, you're beginning to paint a picture in my mind that the United States, you together with with uh, F. Tupper Saucy and his book, Rulers of Evil, are beginning to paint a picture in my mind that the United States has been a Jesuit enclave from the very beginning. When they say that the United States of America has been infiltrated, 
that's a big joke. It has never been infiltrated. This country, as mainly Pope P. Hall says, from its very inception, now mainly P. Hall, uh, you can shrug your shoulders, but that man knew what he's talking about. He knows what he's writing about. From its very inception, this country was founded for a peculiar and particular purpose. Well, what was that peculiar and particular purpose that he's talking about? He's talking about the American Great Seal. Anuit Sepsis Novus Ordo Seclorum. We have conceived a new world order, or the birth of the new world order. That's what it means, right? That's exactly right. And he says, he goes a little bit further. He says that the American Great Seal is the signature of this exalted body. What exalted body? The Jesuits. Now, swallow that. And you might have a hard time getting it down, but I'll tell you what, that's what he's saying. The American Great Seal is the signature of the Jesuits for the purpose and reason it was founded and for the purpose that is the role that is to play in the future. So they gave us a democratic government, a government that uh, honored Protestant tenets, freedom of speech, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, government of, by, and for the people, not a top-down hierarchical structure so that there would be religious tolerance between Protestants and Roman Catholics, that the Roman Catholics in this country would live under a Protestant form of government and gain strength and use the country in the meantime to fight Roman Catholic papal proxy wars all over the world, and that when the time came that even this democratic form of government would be overthrown and then Rome would come out of the closet and then impose its normal form of government, which is a papal dictatorship. They've just been, they've just, they fooled us ever since the founding of this country. Protestants went to sleep. There was no, there was no fighting. There was religious liberty. No suspicion anymore in this country uh, of the Catholics. No, no suspicion of the Pope. No realization that the Pope is the biblical Antichrist. No realization that the Catholics control Congress and the Supreme Court and the military and banking and business and education and the ecumenical movement to, to corrupt the churches. No suspicion whatsoever that the Jesuits are behind perverting our Bibles. No suspicion of anything. Religious peace and liberty between Roman Catholics and Protestants while the Roman Catholic, the Vatican has used this country and, and used the blood of Protestants to fight papal proxy wars all over the world. That's, that's, that's what's happened, isn't it, John? The oath of the Jesuits can be found in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Yeah, it's time for me and to it read states, that. It states... The oath that a Jesuit takes states, for them to accomplish their goal, if they're working among the Calvinists, to become a Calvinist. If they're working among Seventh-day Adventists, to become a Seventh-day Adventist. To become a Protestant, to working among the Protestants to become a Protestant. And working among the Jews even to become a Jew. That's right. 
All it does make no difference, you see. God, That's Jory what Day they one. call That's expedient. It's an end to accomplish a means, or a means to accomplish an end. I'm sorry, I got that backwards. Right, right, right. It's the same as the just end justifies the means. That's the motto of the, the Jesuits. Everybody knows that. But they look, they overlook it when they want to, when it's tried to be pl applied in the reality of what really is going on in the founding of our own country and what they're getting ready to do in the future, the role that this country is going to play. And uh, I'm afraid that this whole world is about to be overwhelmed of the situation that they're going to bring upon this world as a grand finale to bring this whole world under the rulership of the Pope that's going to be set up in the very place that God has placed his name for eternity, and that is Jerusalem. And this is what the Bible calls, and I'll refer back to this, because this is the message of the hour right this very moment. The Bible calls it the abomination that's going to be set up in Jerusalem. And it also states that it's going to desolate this planet when it occurs. The Word of God teaches very strongly, explicitly, that once that event occurs, there shall be a time of trouble such as there never was since there was a nation. In other words, in the history of this planet, we're at the harvest time. We're at the harvest time of this planting as this book brings out, it's an incredible, the three divisions that's in this book. I keep referring to that because that's what this book is all about. You know, the preparation of the ground. It's just like, hey, when you're planting yourself a garden, you prepare the ground. Yeah, and I'm then you prepare to... for what? For the planting. I'm beginning to comprehend something, uh, John. It looks to me like the Jesuits learned a lesson in Great Britain that in order to defeat Protestantism, they had to take a different approach than what they had adopted for Great Britain. And they used that new approach in the United States. It's an entirely different approach than they used in Great Britain. They used violent attacks against Protestantism. They used Catholic uprisings. They used gunpowder plots, Babington plots, assassination attempts, trying to blow up Parliament, the, the Spanish Armada. And they failed, and they failed, and they failed again. And they learned a lesson in Great Britain that if we're going to defeat Protestantism, we have to do it more subtly. And they chose America to do that experiment with, and it has worked marvelously magnificently that right under our very noses they have used this country ever since its founding to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish in Britain. They've destroyed Protestantism and they've used Protestantism to they've created this this so called a Protestant superpower that's secretly doing the bidding of the Pope in the world. And they've accomplished by the United States what they never could have accomplished with Britain because Britain understood the horror of Rome and the threat that Rome posed and also the threat that the Jesuits posed. And we've never understood that here in the, in the United States. We've allowed the Jesuits to build colleges all over this country, 300 institutions of higher learning that are controlled by the Jesuits. High schools, seminaries, colleges, universities, 28 of the most prestigious Je Jesuit universities in this country, and they provide the leaders for this go government. And uh, 
it's just, it's mind-boggling to comprehend what has really happened. It's mind-boggling to comprehend what the Jesuits have achieved in a Protestant land. And no Protestant has ever, at least no one that I know, has ever conceived it or written about it. Now, except for the people that I'm associated with here on LibertyRadioLive.com and some of the people that in my research, but as a percentage of the population, it's but a handful. And look, I talk about these things on amateur radio, uh, which is a, what, what I consider to be a good cross-section of American society. And when I talk about these things, I'm just reviled as an anti-Catholic bigot. And nobody will look into the Jesuit. Well, all he ever talks about is the Jesuits and the Roman Catholic Church. They don't care about that. All they, 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 they call me a religious bigot and an anti-American for crying out loud. They don't, they don't even begin to comprehend what I'm talking about. And, and I'm afraid there's so many of them that are never going to comprehend it. They, they believe that I'm, uh, anti-patriotic. They don't have a clue about the Jesuits' control of this country or the Roman Catholics' control. I talked to so many of them. Oh, the Roman Catholic, the, the Pope doesn't have any power. They don't have any money. Their, pet, their priests are pedophiles. They're losing lawsuits all over the country. The dioceses are bankrupt because of all the payouts they've made to the, to the victims of the priest pedophile pandemic in the world. And the, the, the Catholic Church is not a factor in all this. We have to worry about the Illuminati. We have to worry about Islam. We have to worry about a Jewish conspiracy. We have to worry about uh, our economy. And, and they, 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 the United States has completely missed the point, and I missed the point for most of my life. And now I'm catching on. Now I understand the scriptures and I understand history. And it takes your breath away. I hope we've helped the listeners understand a little bit more of the dynamics that Catholicism has played in this country. We're going to continue reading the book, The Ark and the Dove, and try to glean as much information as possible. But Rome's throwing off the lamb's wool. They're ready to do an inquisition in this country. And the land of this country is going to be soaked with Protestant blood. I'll talk to you more tomorrow. Thanks, John Daniels, for joining me. Stay tuned for Nicholas Arthur's Cross the Border. I'll see you tomorrow. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on satellite, internet, or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. 
When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn, the Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit Cross the Border dot org c r o s s cross the border dot org to get your print epub or pdf version of nicholas arthur's new book titled when the third temple is built that's cross the border dot org